Welcome back to Math for Game Developers. Uh, we're, today we're going to do a video that has absolutely no math in it. <laughs> I know I said I wouldn't do another optimization video, but uh, recently the great Casey over at Handmade Hero has been doing some really cool stuff with general purpose memory allocators. And I wanted to kind of as a compliment to his videos, go through and, and see all the steps that happen in a single memory allocation call so we can understand everything that's going on and why it takes so freaking long to, to allocate memory, why it's so slow, and then correspondingly why game developers tend to, to avoid it. Uh, if you, I, I know a lot of my viewers also watch Handmade Hero, which is great. Um, if you haven't, you should watch these videos. They're really good. You'll learn a lot by doing it, but it's not everything in this video should be self-contained. So let's jump into it. Do, 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 do. We're going to start in C++. I know Handmade Hero doesn't use any C++, and I haven't used C in a while either. Uh, C++ in a while either, but I want to get like the total picture of what's happening here. So I want to start from the very beginning, just in case there is anybody out there using C++. So we're going to start with what happens when you use the new operator, and you get a new widget. So widget is, is maybe some kind of class, and you call the new operator on that widget. So what happens from here? Well, the first thing that happens is the new allocator has to know what size is the memory that needs to be allocated. So it does a size of widget. Really, it's a little bit more complicated than just saying size of widget because it has to have also the size of the super classes and the virtual memory tables and everything. Um, but this is actually a very fast step. It can be done completely at compile time. So we're gonna move on. So now from here, we call essentially malloc. Okay, if you're a C programmer, you should be pretty familiar with, with malloc. It's the general purpose memory allocation routine. So from here on out, and I put, I put quotes around it because C++ doesn't really actually call malloc, right? It, it does something completely equivalent to malloc, so we can think of it from malloc from this point on. Okay, so if you're a C programmer, you start here. <laughs> right um, and it doesn't really call malloc on the inside but it does something completely equivalent so we're thinking about it as malloc so the first thing malloc does we're, we're inside malloc now okay and malloc is part of the c standard library and the c standard library has to be very general because it doesn't know anything about the program that it's that it's uh, binding memory for and this program may have for example many threads running and so the first thing we have to do is we have to get a lock, okay? Uh, we have to say if there are many threads running, then I only, then only one thread at a time can access this code. It's also called a critical section. Okay, only one thread at a time can run the code that is in this critical section of code. And that prevents like two, two threads from from both calling malloc at the same time and then getting back like something wrong like the same area of memory or something if two threads you know call malloc then they should get different areas of memory back and the critical section ensures that all of this lot all of the following logic is only done one at a time if one one thread gets into the critical, critical section then the other thread has to wait so that can be the that's the first sign of slowdown right there so the next task that malloc has to do is it has to do some allocation, allocation logic, some allocation logic. So I'll try and describe what that is. So let's lay out memory right here. This is all of the memory of our process. And maybe we have some, we have some portion down here that's like the static data of the program and, and, and the instructions and so on. And then over here we have the heap, okay? We have the heap, which is the area that is available for uh, for handing out memory from. And then maybe over here on the far right we have the stack. This is a pretty standard picture of of what memory looks like. The stack, the stack grows this way, the heap grows that way. So this dark blue section that I've shaded right here is the total available memory that can be used to hand out memory, 
okay? And so the allocation logic has to look through all of this memory and say, well, some of it is already used. Which part of that is free to, um, to give to the back to the program to return to the program that the program can use and it, it can be fairly complicated this logic can because it has to it has to handle uh, allocation requests in any order and it has to avoid internal and external fragmentation and it has to it has to be very general and really support any any uh, type of allocation a very large one a very small one that the program can do so this can be some some kind of you know, fairly sophisticated logic. And in fact, I'm just gonna call it voodoo because who knows what the hell is happening in here. Um, the, the operating system can create like linked lists or trees or tables or, or whatever in order to do whatever the, the, the library designer thought it's best to do in order to allocate this memory. So you really, there's a black box. You have, it's a black box and black magic. You have no idea what's going on here. Now the question is what happens if we run out of memory in the heap, then we have uh, no memory that we can return to the program. And, and then what we have to do is we have to expand the heap. So here's how that works. This line right here, which divides the heap from empty space is called the break, the break. Or at least that's the name in, in Unix parlance and Windows is, you know, who knows, who knows what it's called. But it separates memory that's been given to the program that it can use from the void, the black area out here that's not allowed to be accessed. If you try and access this memory out here, that's an error. Your program will die. So what we have to do is we have to move the break to the right somewhere over here so that we can expand the heap into the new territory. And then, and then we can allocate from that new section. Okay, but the program is not allowed to move the break by itself because the program is in a certain processor mode called user mode. Okay, and what this means is that it's only allowed to run some subset of all of the instructions that a processor is allowed to run. So it's, it's allowed to do like all this, you know, addition and subtraction and crazy math stuff that we like to do in this channel but it's not allowed to do things like write into another process's memory or, or send viruses to the White House or anything crazy like that. It can't do anything that would interfere with another process on the system. And so this user mode is kind of a container that every process lives in that it's not allowed to get out of that contains only the instructions that it's allowed to do. But we have to get out of user mode if we're going to move this break to the right. And to do that, we make a system call. So let's get a new color here and let's make a system call. So the question is, if we're in user mode, we're not allowed to execute the instruction that would get us into kernel mode. Kernel mode is the kernel mode. Kernel mode is the mode where the processor is allowed to do any instruction and only the coremost part of the operating system called the kernel is allowed to be in kernel mode. But you can only change the break in kernel mode. So we have to figure out how to get from user mode into kernel mode and that's what the system call does. And the mechanism that it uses to do that is called a trap. And a trap is basically, it, it says the, to the processor, the, the program says, it basically says, I made an error. Go to the operating system, go to the kernel and figure out what error happened. It's a special error that when the kernel sees it, it says, oh, okay, that wasn't really an error. That was actually the program making a system call. It just wants some memory. But what, what happens when this trap occurs is that your pipeline, and I went over how a pipelined processor works in a previous video, I'm pretty sure Casey has done it too. Your pipeline goes bye-bye. Goodbye pipeline. Everything that the processor had queued up to execute has to be completely thrown out because the processor is now executing in a new mode. Additionally, the kernel can't run, the kernel can't run uh, without messing with the registers that the program was using. So the kernel has to take these registers, 
and write them out to memory and save them so that it can restore the registers later for the program. And this is called a context switch. It copies all of the registers that were in the processor that the program was using to do its logic out to some special place in memory and it saves them there. And then later when the system call is done, it will copy them back into the register. So that takes time. Uh, so the pipeline gets flushed, that takes time. The context switch gets flushed, that takes time. We have to go to the trap handler and it has to do a bunch of more logic. So all of this stuff takes time. Okay. So finally we're done doing that. Now we are inside the kernel. We're inside the kernel. And the first thing that the kernel has to do is it has to say, well, I have to find some memory. And this, this is now physical memory on the, on the, um, on the, like the memory, the actual memory chip that you plug into the, your computer. I have to find some physical memory for the process to use. And so we have to do another lock another lock because we don't want two programs to be trying to figure to to do a, a memory allocation routine at the same time and both think that they can get the same physical memory or who knows what else we have to again lock so that only one program only one process can do this at a time so that's another lock and, and again locks take time and then once we've got that lock in there we have to do more allocation logic but this time it's slightly different instead of instead of uh, having a, a heap here of available stuff available memory that we can return now we're looking for free memory pages we might have some memory pages out here a memory page is I'm pretty sure usually 4k 4,000 bytes worth of memory that is in your memory card and some of them are used and some of them are not used and so the OS has to go find which ones are used and which ones are not used and then say okay let's see this one is used and this one is used but this one and this one are not so I'm gonna put this one here and it's and it's moving them into place so that we can move the break to the right it can't move the break to the right unless this this new memory right here is being backed by something but what happens if what happens if there are no free pages? Well, then what we have to do is we have like, if there are no free pages here and all of these pages are used, then the operating system actually says, okay, let's find some other process that has some pages that haven't been used in a long time and write them out to disk. And so it will write them out to disk and that will free up some pages that it can put in this spot so that it can move the break right. And so you actually might get some disk IO in order to free a page. It's possible that this, this is the worst case scenario, but it could happen. Okay, so finally, we've gotten some free memory pages, we've put them on the break, and then the processor moves the, the I'm sorry, the operating system moves the break right, and then we return this memory to the, the process that asked for it, we maybe do a little bit more allocation logic so that we we mark that you know that this part right here for example is the is the part that the original new operator requested we return that and then we're back into user mode user mode and then our program finally has this memory and just goes happily on its way uh, oh I forgot to make a note right here this is more voodoo Voodoo is important. Okay, so if we're C programmers, we're done. We finally have our memory. This is what we needed. But if we're C++ programmers, we're not even started because we have to run a constructor. The constructor is a function that sets up the memory with initial values. And if you're a C++ programmer, chances are you've written a constructor at some point. A constructor is really just code that the programmer writes. So it can call any code. It can call other constructors. It can call virtual functions and operator overloads and move constructors and, and who knows what else. It can, it can send a, an unmanned mission to Mars. It can, it can Google to see who's gonna be the Republican candidate this year. It can do anything. So whereas this stuff up here 
is it, it takes a while, but it takes a consistent while. Like it always takes about the same amount of time and it will never take up more than this amount of time. The constructor is unbounded. You have a completely unbounded amount of code that can happen in this constructor, especially if it's written by someone you don't know. It could, you know, it, you're using some library where you say new and then you, and then you want to make an object that the library gave you someone else wrote the constructor and who knows what is happening inside of that constructor so that can take even way longer than than all of this junk up here okay so in total we have let's see what we have we have two locks okay we have a bunch of allocation logic we have a system call which means we do a trap we empty our pipeline we uh, do two context switches one to get into kernel mode and one to get out and then we even possibly do some disk IO and who knows what other voodoo we do. We do a ton of stuff. How much of this is avoidable? Let's take it one by one. This, this, okay, this we don't care about. This doesn't even take any time. So the locks, this lock right here, we can say in our program, well, I'm only gonna allocate memory from one thread. I make that as a rule for myself when I write my program. I'm only ever going to allocate memory from one thread and free it from one thread. So I don't have to care about synchronizing threads. I don't care about locks critical sections. I can get rid of that. I can get rid of locks. Again, it, it is necessary. You need locks if you have a multi-threaded program if this function is called by more than one thread. But if we make a rule just by ourselves that we're going to only call our allocation routine from one thread, then we don't need it. But the library is a general purpose library, so it can't make that assumption. But we can get rid of this lock. Uh, same way we can get rid of this other lock because we know that we're the only process who's going to try to allocate the, uh, try to call this, this function. By definition, it only happens in our process. It's the only process. Uh, we can get rid of this system call just by doing it once at the beginning of our program, or at least just a few times at the beginning of our program, and then never again. So then we can, get, we can, when we write our own routine, we use the memory that was given to us by, uh, so we get rid of this and we get rid of this disk IO. And then how do we get rid of this allocation logic? Well, we can't get rid of it entirely, but what we can do is we can study the allocation behaviors of our program. Certain subsets of our program we know are going to, for example, always deallocate memory in the same order that it gets allocated. And so for that, we can use a ring allocator. Or maybe uh, we for some part of our program, we know that we're only gonna need this memory for a short amount of time. And then so we can use a frame allocator. Or maybe we see that we're, we're going to allocate the memory once at the beginning of our program and then we'll never need to do it again. So for example, a string table or something, and then we have a static allocator. So these are all different types of allocators, which I won't describe, allocators. Maybe if I get a lot of requests, I might go into some, some of them in more detail, but what they do is they take advantage of the structure of your allocations and, and data that a general all allocator doesn't have to make very fast allocation logic. Like a ring allocator can be a single page of code. A frame allocator is a single page of code. They're not very complicated. They're not voodoo. And since you've written them yourself, you know exactly what's in them. They don't have any unbounded running times. So they're much faster. So we don't get rid of this step, but we reduce it a great degree. And so a uh, hand-coded allocator is gonna be, oh, and, um, and of course we have no constructors. <laughs> We can, we can write any constructor we want that doesn't have any crazy stuff, any un unbounded stuff in it. Um, okay, that's good, that was a lot of fun. Now I am seriously this time going to go on to uh, a few to-do videos that I've had on to do, my to-do list, and then we're gonna get into the topic that I really wanted to get into, which is numerical analysis, which I'm very much looking forward to. We're gonna learn how floating point math works guys it's gonna be really cool i'm excited for that uh, i will see you next time